Hello, everybody. I'm Shani from Uncle Bobby's, and we have a great event for you all tonight. We have Philly's own Quinta Brunson, and she'll be discussing her new book, She Means Well. The title couldn't be more fitting, and the book is hilarious from beginning all the way to the end. She'll be joined in conversation by the effortlessly talented poet and writer, Jasmine Mans. Um, today, this is, this is, this is going to be a great event. Um, I'm huge fans of both of these women, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to introduce them all. Um, Quinta is, she's great. Jasmine is great as well. Of course, there'll be a live Q&A after the event. So make sure that you ask a question using the ask a question module. Um, if you're in the Philly area and would like to come and pick up a book, feel free to do so because we'll, <laughs> we'll be there. Um, if you can't get to the bookstore, no worries. We have a bookshop website that you will be able to get your book from and have it sent directly to you. Quinta is ready for the introduction. She's an actor, a producer, a stand-up comedian, and she's also been named one of Forbes' 30 under 30, and she's been featured in Vogue, People, Essence, and the Hollywood Reporter, among others, for her pioneering work in comedy. And she plays a lead role in the HBO series, A Black Lady Sketch Show. I'm not sure if y'all heard of it before, but it's hilarious. Jasmine Manns is a poet and artist from Newark, New Jersey. She graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a BA in African-American Studies. Her debut collection of Poetry, Chalk Outlines of Snow Angels was published in 2012, and she is a resident poet at the New York Public Library. She's also a member of the Strivers Row Collective, and she has a new book that was published in March called Black Girl Call Home, also a true fave. And with that, I would like to bring on to the screen Quinta and Jasmine. Hey, girl. Here we go. Here we go. Hi, y'all. Oh. How I wear my doing? hoops for you. <laughs> I got my braids done. For I got you. my braids for you. I got my braids done seven hours for you yesterday. You don't know what I went through to get this appointment uh -oh. for you. I am very happy to be talking yeah. to you today. I'm so happy to be talking to you. I love your one of your first poems in your book. I think, if not the first poem, is about getting your braids taken out. Yes, yes. I'm going to be cute as soon as my mama get home. I love that poem. It, it, it reminded me of my relationship with my my sisters and stuff. My hair got braided by my sister, and you know, that that was like spiritual. I love your book of poems. I know this is not your event; it's mine. This ain't about you know, me. I love this is not poems. about me. And speaking <laughs> of family, you got some yes. folks in here. Um, I so, uh, I hi Quinta. This is your aunt Wanda and Uncle Reg. They're tuning into your event. And they are so excited and happy for you. And they're looking forward to reading your book, girl. Oh, and then Miss Schick, Ms. Schick from Chad is here. Yes, from yes. High School. This is great. Ms. Mr. Ruth and her are very thrilled about your success. <laughs> Say hi to your people. They I love am, you, girl. Hi, you guys. Hi, Ms. Schick. Hi, Mr. Ruth. Hi, Gia. I see my sister in here. My friend Tasia is in here. Oh, this is really sweet and exciting. Hi, Uncle Reggie. Hi, Wanda. I think my mom so, and dad are going to try to log in, but that's hard. And I think that might be Devin from also. Hi, mom and dad. Maybe. So, yes. all right. Let, let's 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 get started. I'm super excited to to chat with you today. Um, you know, the first thing, one of the first things, well, first, how do you feel about telling all your business? <laughs> now, that, now that the book is here, how do you feel? Like, I like I told secrets, you told some secrets. Like, how do you oh, feel? No. Your, mama, your mama's about to read all of this? No, she's not. She's not. She's actually not allowed to read the book. Um, my mom is not allowed to read it. Um, but, you know, I woke up in a cold sweat last night thinking, did I say too much in my book? Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but I woke up in a cold sweat at like three o'clock in the morning last night. 
But, you know, when I was writing the book, I thought I had a real opportunity, similar to you in your book of poems, to, like, be honest for Black girls, you know? I think we keep a lot of ourselves hidden or we present a facade of, of who we are and who is acceptable and what is acceptable. And we try to redo our history to fit like a certain mm -hmm. standard that's acceptable. And, you know, I thought this was an important moment to be the black girl from Philly that I am and put that on display and hopefully make it, make the world a more comfortable place for, for other young black girls, specifically from Philly, but from anywhere and for other people. All right, since you went there, like this book is for black girls from Philly? I think so. You know, it didn't start out that way, but then that's who I started writing to. I started- Because I was, I wrote my book for black girls from Newark and mm -hmm. how important is it for you to make sure that your people know that it's for them. Because it's like, you don't have to name names or or name streets or locations, but you were very specific about, I went to this school, it was this street, it was this place. How important is that for you to make sure that you are identifying self in your work? Man, I guess it, it became important to me as I wrote the book. There's actually a section when I talk about my favorite like songs and stuff like that and my favorite music. And it's something I didn't make in the book was like, Okay, so you know this song by Lauryn Hill, Every Ghetto, Every City. You know this. He's from my hood. That's my that's my hood. So I didn't even know that. And what's funny about that song is when I was little and I first heard it for the first time, I remember hearing it for the first time was when my sister was braiding my hair, my other sister Kayana, who's not in here, and she was a big Lauryn Hill fan. And I was like, Oh my God, she's talking about where I live. Cause she starts naming things. She says like something like Chancellor Street, which is the street that I was from. But she wasn't talking about Mm -hmm. Oh, is there Chancellor Street in Newark? Yeah. I grew up on Chancellor Avenue. Yep. You, so I grew up on Chancellor mm -hmm. Street in Philly. That's so crazy. Um, mm -hmm. My cousin Punkin is here. Hey, Punkin. So like when she was saying all that stuff in Lauren Hill and I was little, I was like, oh my gosh, she's talking about where I'm from. Like that just, it, it made me feel just special. Like it made me feel like unique in that places where I'm from can be put in music like this. And then I got older and found out Lauren Hill wasn't from Philly. But I remembered how happy it made me. So feel. sad. So disappointing. It was so disappointing. But it, it made me so happy when I did learn, when I did think that she was. And it made me so happy when my favorite music artists, you know, and my, my favorite artists, I found out that they were from where I'm from, like The Roots and, you know, um, and Jill Scott. But I think for people in my world, like comedy and especially the kind of comedy I'm in, a lot of times they don't know where I'm from. People might think, I've heard people think I'm like a suburban girl or that I grew up somewhere that wasn't like the city. And I grew up in West Philly and I want other girls from like West Philly to feel the way I feel when it's like, uh-uh, did she just mention my home? Did she just mention my, like that means something to us because I just think it's special. It makes us feel like a mix of we can do it too and then represent it and proud. It makes us feel pride. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of pride in your book and it started off, I, I was so like happy about how it started off with your blackness. And I mean, I guess it had to start that way because you started off as a little black girl. And so, but you told us about how, what kinds of schools you went to and how important blackness was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really appreciate that. One thing that I feel like deeply connected me to your work was when you started talking about your mama and that <laughs> moment in the car that you had with your mom. Yeah. And, and you noticed how scared your mother was for you. Yeah. Um, talk to me about just being a daughter for a second. And then <laughs> tell me why your mama can't read the book. <laughs> Damn it, Jasmine. Uh <laughs> Well, you know, my mom and I have such a great close relationship now. I talk to her at least once a day. And if I don't talk to her once a day, it, there's like a possibility she'll call the cops because she'll think something is wrong. Like, she was like, <laughs> in LAPD, I don't like y'all, but go check on my baby. I think, so we're so close. But back in the day, 
there was just tension that I think arose because I wanted to be this out of the box person that didn't fit my mom's agenda at the time. And when you're younger, especially mm -hmm. I think with young black woman, black mom relationships, all you see is like this defiant figure trying to dis decide what you are, stop you from doing things, mm -hmm. take away your fun. But, and I, and I wanted to focus that chapter on capturing what that felt like. You know, a lot of my book was about being honest about how I felt in the moments, not doing like revision. And that's what I love because it was like, there were these, it wasn't, it was moments that we all experience as like children, as girls, like, mm -hmm. and, and the way you describe these moments made us feel really seen and heard because it was like, yeah, but tell me, tell me more about your mom. Well, you know, yeah, my mom, she's, she's just so incredible and sweet and kind. And, and I, it was weird to me at that time that I wasn't getting there. Our, our relationship had become turbulent the way a lot of teen you know, young adult relationships become with their mm -hmm. mother. But I, I I thought it was so significant how years later, I'm out here in LA, I'm away from my family, missing my family. And it just hit me one day, you know, I'm experiencing the world. I'm losing friends to drugs in, in, in like the world. It was everything my mom would describe. And, and you know, I'm losing friends to the demons of this world and it just, hit me like my mom the, she birthed me she gave birth to me like of course she wanted to protect me by any means necessary but I just didn't see it that way when I was a young girl I just saw it as she's just trying to strip away my fun and I, I couldn't understand I'm like you put me in dance class you made me all smart you sent me to smart schools why don't you want me to just like go out there and be smart and be cool and perform <laughs> what's the problem but then you know I, it was that chapter lands on looking at your your mother in particular as a full human being as someone who was a young woman herself as someone who had more relationships than you even know about as someone who has been through so much i talk a lot about who lost stuff before you lost stuff who lost stuff before you lost stuff and i and i get to that in the book like talking about the fact that you know when i got older you know people my mom had lost in her life i was like i couldn't even imagine i can't even believe she's still standing here i, I could cry thinking about it it's probably so much my family is like in the chat but like I, I just, and I never want to de deal with that, but the fact that my mother did deal with that and is still standing here is so strong. And I think many of our black mothers have been in the same position and we have to like look at them for their strength and like understand how incredible that is, but also that it shouldn't have to be that way. <laughs> But um, just looking at them as, as full human beings, I think, is important. Tell us a bit how, about how your mother and your, your family in general is digesting the woman and the success you are right now. My family is amazing. They're very supportive. Like my brother, Quay, he, is, he, he treats my accomplishments like his own. He's so supportive. <laughs> and my sisters... Um, I don't know. They're they're nothing but supportive in in the same thing with my my other brother, but I think what's most what's most cool about my family is they don't treat me much different like at all. They're just proud of me, but mm -hmm. they treat me pretty much how they treat me anyway. Like my sister Gia still makes fun of me, and I'm just like, "Gia, I'm successful now. You can't like say my feet are ugly." But she still does. And I think that's nice. <laughs> They're really supporting my mom and dad, I think, are just now starting to reckon with it. You know, like for a while, it was me floating around out here doing doing stuff that I don't think they fully understood, like the Internet stuff and BuzzFeed. But then, like, it became more concrete uh, with the sketch show. It was like, OK, you're doing something. When So it was that the moment that they noticed that you were like somebody? Because I feel like there's yeah. always... Your people don't really care about who you are to the rest of the world. And I think yeah. it wasn't until my family knew that they could go. And the first time my dad went Pick to the bookstore, book. 
Yeah, it mm -hmm. wasn't at the bookstore. So he was like, Jasmine, the book is not even here. Are you, is this real? Are but you like, really a, po a poet? <laughs> And, but when did they notice your, like, when did they, when were they convinced? They were convinced when, like, they started to see advertisements, I think, for the sketch show and, like, my face popping up unprompted on TV. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like, my mom would call me and it was like, I just saw something on TV and I saw your, your, your face. I saw you on TV. It was a commercial in between um, Dr. Phil and, and, um, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it was a commercial for this show I'm gonna be on, Mom. And she's like, oh, well, okay. You know, that became like, all right. Before then, I think there was a chance my mom thought I was stripping because she just didn't understand how I was like making money. She just wasn't like clear on it, you know? I could say I work for BuzzFeed, but like, what does that mean to someone who- What does that mean? Like not on the internet. And so I do also think with this, my new show that I, I have coming out on ABC, that's about my mom's story. She was a public school teacher. Um, and that was super concrete for them. Also just like hearing ABC, like a network they know and watch, right, right. you know, like she's like, I can, I can say this will be on TV. It'll come on, you know, same channel that Blackish comes on. And that's like a nice thing to point to, you know, that they get it now, I think. I think. They get it. it You're be. in their world. You're in yeah. their world. Their, their fame world. is so interesting. Yeah. Um, the in, like, and the funny thing is, like, you've been in our world forever. Like, you've been, like, a part of, like, our web subconscious forever. We know your memes. We know your voice. We know your facial expressions. Um, and, and we've grown up with the internet. And so we know, like, the utility of what the internet provides. Um, Tell us a bit about how, like, you, you talk about it in the book so much, but tell us more about how the internet, like, shifted you as an artist, you as a comedian. Well, yeah. the internet made you want to be a comedian. Yeah, I think, so I wanted to work in comedy before the internet came into into my life. I don't think I was being honest about wanting to work in comedy. I thought it was a far-fetched goal. And I, I had to land somewhere between like advertising and communications or dance. Yeah. And then, it, then comedy became more of a reality to me. And, you know, I already was just a fan of the internet. I was an internet kid. I was like on AIM. I was in Degrassi chat rooms. I was on the computer till 12 o'clock in the morning. Like, you know, just being on the internet. Um, but, but then, you know, once the video, the He Got Money video went viral, that changed my idea of what my career could be. Before that, I had kind of like it, the idea that I'm going to do comedy shows and then I'm going to get on SNL. That was the pipeline I saw. But then when my mm -hmm. video went viral, that changed what my career could look like. And I embraced that change, you know, and embraced the internet's place in my career instead of rejecting it because I, I saw it as like this really powerful tool to be able to get out there and build, you know, people get to see me and, and, and see my work instead of me maybe popping up in a show where I never get to use my own voice. I could act. Right. I mean, I didn't right. do it. So it's really cool to be able to have the internet in that way. Cause it's one of those things where sometimes I'll be with other comics and stuff who other comedians and they're like, we don't understand how you have such a deep fan base because they don't use the internet. And I'm like the internet, that's how I have like, you know, I, mm. I got to give my voice to people and, and they liked my, vo my work, my voice, my work and that that's like invaluable. It's something that people try to do through stand up from the stage, um, and and they do it. And the internet is just another way to do that. Do you ever get nervous, like for the future of the internet, of like, can, can are we going to be able to keep up? Because we're now reaching that, like, we grown now. Oh and no, I'm like already, I'm already feeling phased out. Like TikTok, I don't know how to work it's TikTok. Hard. It's hard. So, so how do you feel like you're going to navigate the future? I'm just going to ride the wave. Like I, that's all I can do. You know, like the technological revolution has moved and will continue moving so fast. Who would have thought 20 years, 
20 years from now, you know, we were like, MySpace is going to be around forever. It's obsolete. It's gone. Vine came and went. It was the biggest thing in the world. Instagram is on its way out. There might be something new tomorrow to kick TikTok out the door. And then as like devices continue to get like more and more insane, we, we're, we're, I mean, I'm 31 and I'm already, I feel old when I open TikTok. I'm like, I don't I'm know. I'm 30 to, and I feel old. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So I think I'm gonna just ride the wave, you know? I, I think it's interesting because I already wanted my relationship to change with technology and social media anyway. And that's kind of naturally happening. Like, I'm like, I don't need this to be as prevalent in my life anymore. So how, how that was a question, how is your relationship with social media shifting? And how do you like manage a healthy social media relationship? You, you, it's shifting now in that, you know, I think our generation, our relationship with social media was presenting a certain version of ourself online. It, it like started with MySpace, it continued with Facebook, and then Instagram did it. And I don't really care about presenting a certain version of myself anymore. I'm at the point where I just want to be. And, mm. uh, but the Instagram algorithm doesn't like that. The Instagram algorithm actually <laughs> wants you to present <laughs> the fake and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'm just like naturally falling off of it. And, and as I get growner and, and I'm a person who cares about my family and cares about, oh, my dad's here and cares about my, my people, my, you know, my people, that's when I want to nurture. That's what I, where I want to put my energy. I want to build my real life community outside of the internet mm -hmm. and just like use the internet for promotion and like business. But I'm not interested in presenting some like, you know, pretty fake version of like what, what life is instead of just mm -hmm. living life, you know? And, and so as time goes on, I, I really wish I could get off of Instagram, get off of Twitter. Twitter's just straight up bad for my brain. I just don't, <laughs> it's so bad. And, and I, and I want to get off completely, but I'm going to let the relationship go the way it's supposed to go. But I, I do want to get off. It's so funny because um, while, I, while I was reading your book, I was like, you were talking about becoming prom queen. I was prom queen too. And so I was like, oh, we have that in common. But yes, I, true. the day, the day that um, like at prom, we did the dance and it, it was so funny because you were describing your dance, but that's like, I really, at that moment, it solidified for me that I was a lesbian because I was like, it was, I could not dance with this boy whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it was Crockett Cates, and we were asked to dance with each other, mm -hmm. and I was the most awkward person in the oh. world. And I was like, I think that I'm not meant to dance with boys. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> what like, a moment to I, figure that out. You're just like, it was at it was at prom, and I was prom, <laughs> and I had to, and everybody was watching, and I was like, Yeah, girl, you you gay, you go you gay. People be gay. Um, pe People be people be gay. They just. <laughs> um, how did you decide which moments you wanted to put into this book? So the idea behind the book originally was defining moments worth sharing, and that's the idea behind a meme. Like a meme is a little moment mm -hmm. that that you share, and I thought back in my past, and I was like what are the moments that define me the most? What are the moments that I think about often? What are the moments that were a change in womanhood for me, a change in <laughs> career? And, you know, that's how I landed on moments like my elementary schooling. That was a defining period of my life. If I didn't go to that ele elementary school, I don't know if I would have been the person I am, you know, it was a very, very special elementary school. My high school was a very special high school that taught me. My elementary school made me proud to be black. My high school made me proud to be creative. My college period was when I, you know, was like, well, I'm just simply proud to be me now and I'm going to trust that. And then, you know, stuff like the relationships in my life with boys and stuff always taught me something new about myself where I was like, no, no. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Where you learn what kind of person you are as a woman and what kind of partner 
you want in your life. I think those are defining moments. And um, I wanted to share the, the exact moments of my womanhood that I look at as like footnotes. And mm. so it was so funny because um, when I was reading about the razor fight, um, yes. which is hilarious, <laughs> it's like, is Shorty about to tell us that she cut somebody? Is that what? <laughs> but, but I, I, I the funny, and, and the thing is, it's so interesting because you don't think that certain moments are supposed to define you. And like you talk, like, I'm sure you often talk about your life. And like, I always go by this playbook of like, this is what I said to write and da, 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 da. And like, but those weren't actually my defining moments. And when right. I was reading the book, I like literally started crying because I remembered my best friend Zakia. Yeah. And I remember when Oneida Quinones in elementary school was about to beat me up. Mm -hmm. And I was a huge Tupac fan mm -hmm. and I was a rapper in elementary school. I was like a I was like a, a gangster battle rapper before I became I a poet. I was and a huge so Beanie Siegel fan, so I was like, I think he's one of the best writers of our generation, but exactly. we'll get to that later. I understand. <laughs> and so I'm about to get my ass beat because I've never fought before. And I know Oneida Quinones has fought people before. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can think to say is you better back the fuck up before you get smacked the fuck up because that was the <laughs> Tupac line. And Zakia came running out of the, the classroom yeah. and me and Zakia fought the girl. But I knew that if I said that loud enough, Zakia would come to save me. And right. I started like tearing up because I was like, wow, that was a defining moment in our friendship. It She's is. not my friend anymore. But I was like, those, those are the moments. Those are the moments. And like, that was the thing with uh, those girls. I write about that chapter, going to fight with these girls. And I'm not a fighter. I'm just not. But I was like, these are my friends. If we have to go fight, then we have to go fight. Like, I'm not going to turn my back on these girls. Uh, it also, it's just Philly. Like, sometimes you're just in situations you where you might have to fight, okay? Like, I don't know what to say. You can't escape that. It doesn't matter it how, good, it doesn't matter how mm -hmm. good a kid you are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what school you go to. You find yourself in a position where you might have to fight someone that day. And I think it was just innate in me. <laughs> but I'm down to, I think what I tried to express in that chapter is, like, that changes over time. Like I'm always gonna fight for my friends and have my friends back. Sure, it looks different when you're not in high school and it's not like a fist fight when all your mm -hmm. hormones are raging and stuff, but mm -hmm. that defined what it meant to show up for my friends from that point on. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to fight, but I will. I will, what, I'll still what, fight on behalf of my friends. <laughs> what does it mean to show up for a friend? Now that means, you know, some of my some of my best girlfriends still are, are in Philly. And so, you know, we don't hang out every day. We don't talk every day. But I think it means making the effort to hang out when I when I am home. Like I hit my girlfriends up and I'm like, I'm here. Like, let's let's try to do something. Let's try to get together. Let's we'll go to a restaurant or we'll go to my friend's house. Like my friend Tage is in here. Like we'll go to Tage's house and eat crab legs. And if somebody's going through something, it's being there for each other. That doesn't always mean having the answers, but like if if somebody's like in the group text saying this is happening, being there for support and saying, I got your back. How can I help you? What can I do to help in this situation? Especially for me, not being home in Philly, it's like, what can I do from here in LA to help? You tell me mm -hmm. and, and I will do it because you're my friend and you need it. And I think like, that's what it means to show up as a friend for me these days. Um, and it's what my friends do for me too, which which is important. Like, I talk a lot about the meaning of the word friend in that chapter because it's been, you know, convoluted between Facebook and, you know, mm -hmm. social media mm -hmm. and all that. But, you know, my real friends know my family. They, they I know their family. We can, checking each other checking on each other in a deeper way to be like my real friends can tell me i'm wrong my fake friends online can't tell me i'm wrong they think everything i do is right <laughs> my real friends can be like no Quentin, you're out of line yeah because we realize that like nowadays like you we do like mesh up the facebook and the social media friends and the real friends and we realize that we just spend a lot of time trying to collect numbers and they're yeah. not even friends they're, they're numbers
Mm-hmm. And and you don't even foster your actual friendships because we're always searching for more friends. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm my book just came out and I I be feeling a lot. I know, but <laughs> how has your book changed? Get her book, y'all. Sorry, real quick. I quick plug. Get her book. It's one of my favorite books of the year. Oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. How how did that? How did your book change you? Oh man. Well, maybe you 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 experienced this with writing your your books. I don't know because I think you're just like a little bit more in tune to writing your own experiences than I am. But writing your own book feels like therapy. But you're the therapist, and like mm. you're talking to yourself. For me, wanting to be super honest in the book, it was like, okay, what have I put a band aid on to keep moving on in life? And, and, and what actually happened? What was the actual situation? How did I actually feel? How did I grow from those things? Have I grown at all from those things? Do I need to like do some growing? But mm. I think it changed, changed me because it forced me to be more honest, period, in every area. I'm like- Honesty is a bitch. It's crazy. It's Even trying to be honest about- Published the- honesty. Published Publish. honesty that like sits on bookshelves, girl. That's different. It's like it's I was like, scary. Oh, it's scary. They gonna know. They gonna know. So, it's it's scary. But and I was I was like, you know what I can do though? If I can feel confident that I can back everything up up in this book, then I feel good about that. If I if I can feel that everything in this book is the truth, and. Uh, I, I can feel okay with that, you know? I didn't have to like lie or make anyone look bad. There was even stuff in the chapter with my mom where I called my mom and I was like, mom, are you okay with me writing about this? Because I wanna mm-hmm. be honest. I wanna talk about my experience as a black girl who learned that her black mom was a full person. And I want like a younger black girl to read this and be like, let me stop being so rude to my mom, you know? And I was like, but that requires like, intense honesty from people like you and me. And if we're not doing our job being honest writers, then we're just putting crap out there, really. And I know because I read some of those books and it's like the books that's telling you how to live your life. And it's like, and I meet the author in real life and I'm like, well, you just wrote a book telling people what to do and you you don't do anything. And you don't mm-hmm. know anything. And I didn't mm-hmm. want to do that. So that required honesty, you know? And I think the book mm-hmm. is more honest. And I think honesty makes you more accountable. Um, because one thing I realized, I was like, oh, I got to act different now that this book is here. Did what you am grow I... up? Accountable? <laughs> did I grow up accountable? <laughs> no, did you grow up? Did this book grow you? Um, did it grow me? Um, Probably. Probably. I had more conversations with my mom while writing this book about life than I had had before. And I think that was cool. And I think that grew mm-hmm. me up too. And I think that uh, the accountability, it's interesting you talked about that, about the the honesty and accountability, because that's the thing who people have read it. That's the thing they've said to me so far. They were like, you're so accountable. Like in your book, you say when you're wrong and then you like move on. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'm wrong sometimes because I'm human and sometimes humans are wrong and I still did it, but it was wrong Mm -hmm. and I shouldn't Mm -hmm. have it. I've, I've, you know, learned why, how I was wrong and I can look back and know I was wrong. Sometimes I am intentional and I'm still wrong and that's just a part of life. And I think that um, accountability is what I wanted people to see. I wanted people to see just accountability and honesty and yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I've always been a pretty honest person, though, you know, unless I'm just like intentionally telling a lie, I'm usually <laughs> problematically honest to the point where people don't like that. So it was actually nice to put it in the book. <laughs> what was the hardest moment of the book for you? What 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 part of the book is hardest to read and reflect upon? You know, there's a chapter I wrote about. You, I think you can relate to this because you're from Newark and like about gun violence in Philly and how it affected my family. And that that chapter actually flowed out of me. Like I wrote mm-hmm. that chapter, my editor touched that chapter and 
I wrote it and I was crying while I was writing. It's, it's the one chapter that I was like crying the whole time. That's what I meant mm. about like the therapy shit where sometimes it's like, it's just, it's this stuff you don't say out loud that all of a sudden you start writing and now it's like pouring out of your fingers. And, but now when I go back and try to read that chapter, it's a little bit hard for me. Um, but I want other people to read it. I know so many people in Philly need to read something about the, the reality of the horror of the gun violence in Philly. And I think that's what I attempted and got to do with that chapter, but I don't want to reread it because yeah. it's still happening. We're having a worse summer than we've ever had. Um, and I want it to stop. <laughs> and I, I wish that like the chapter was reflective and not current. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, but when I wrote that chapter, I mean, it just flowed out of me because I think I needed to get it out. Like that I'm tired of how gun violence is like this plague that seemingly nothing can be done about. And it's so many factors as to why it happens. But the reality is it doesn't, I don't care why it happens anymore. I want it to stop affecting us. I want it to stop affecting our families, stop affecting our communities. We shouldn't have to live like this. Like, it's not natural. When did you realize that you could be a utility to even talk about these things? I think when I moved away from Philly and started like for, the gun violence issue, for example, when I moved away from Philly and started looking at Philly from the outside, I was like, okay, I might be one of the only people who has this perspective and is still dialed in. Like, I think a lot mm -hmm. of us believe Philly and they're, they're desperate to get away from it and pretend it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. I don't want to pretend mm -hmm. it doesn't exist. My whole family mm -hmm. is, it, you know, we've been affected by it recently. That alone makes me a person who should talk about it because I care. And I see what it is like. L.A. is not even like that. Like the the hood in L.A. doesn't have that issue in that way, and I and I want it to change. So, I think that alone makes me the person to talk about it. You know, just being mm -hmm. someone who cares, has the platform, has an option, and wants it to change. I think that's all you need. Sometimes it feels. I guess a bit hard when you you come when you're dealing with some black shit, but you coexist in a very white world, um, and you're like, where do, wh where am I allowed to talk about the pain? Absolutely. And am I allowed to do it around these white folks? And do these white folks understand it and get it? Did you do you do you? I know you feel that. I feel it, and that's that's kind of like the entry point to that chapter, like dealing with that stuff out here in a very like white, I was working at Buzzfeed at the time. So corporate world and dealing with gun violence affecting my family and ha having no outlet, like at the time, like I was, I had no one to say like, yo, this just happened. And for someone else to have a similar experience, cause it's not that I want to, I don't want to cry about it. Sometimes you just want to look at someone and be like, that's messed up. But no one else here could, you know, relate. I don't want them to relate. It's horrible. At the mm -hmm. time, I had just started dating someone and was really liking him. And he's white. Now my fiance. But even then, I was like, I'm going to have to break up with you because you don't, I can't mm -hmm. talk to you about this. And that that makes me sad and it, it shouldn't be happening and I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should move back home and be in it, which is like mm -hmm. a great thought. But even with talking about it now, and I can't like talk about it online, right? Sometimes I try to share something about the, the violence in Philly on Twitter and nobody engages with it. And I think people are too afraid to comment on it. People are they think it's none of their business. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Maybe they're right. So I think that's why my book felt like the right place to talk about it, because this is my book. So if you're picking it up, you are signing up for the Quinta Brunson experience and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're going to get this conversation so that you go somewhere and think about how you can change this gun violence issue because mm -hmm. people like to think about it as a mass shooter thing and, a ma and you know, events like shooting events. This is happening in Philly every day. So what can you do to go change gun laws if that's what you can do? And mm -hmm. stop thinking it's so far away. More people than you know are close to it. Like, 
I, and I just think almost any successful black person from a city has the same experience. So, yeah. It's important and we're grateful for it, like truly. Yeah. What, how, how do we get to the title? How do we get to She Memes Well? Well, it's, it's twofold, you know, a play on the term she means well, she means well, or, you know, they mean well. I think mm -hmm. I mean well. I don't think I'm always, <laughs> I don't think I'm always right. I think I'm, I'm, I mean well. I'm always, I'm trying to do the right thing, but that doesn't mean I'm always right. And I, I'm trying mm -hmm. to fix, always trying to fix things, but maybe I do it the wrong way. My mom actually says that to me. She's like, you always come down here to Philly, come home and I try to fix stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean well. I don't know what to say, but... But and then with the memes thing, you know, I've been a meme so many times and I wanted to talk about the Internet and I wanted to talk about my growth and my career that the two, it just came together. It just seemed like the perfect title of She Memes Well. Beautiful. We got some questions for you in the um, in the chat. One okay. of the questions are uh, give us some advice for up and coming comedians. OK. I have two pieces of advice, my standard advice. I think that you should work on your craft first and foremost so that you can do your craft anywhere. Like if you're just good and you study comedy, all forms of it, you study the greats, you study the lesser greats, go to shows, be around the atmosphere, be around the culture, and you get good at it, you have to get good enough to be able to do it in a bunch of arenas, I think. Like you should be able to do it in stand up. It's smart to be able to do it on screen as an actor. I think it's smart to be able to do it on the internet and, and, and you know, anywhere you can be comedic, I think it's a good idea to use those stages. But first and foremost, your craft has to be intact. You have to be good at what you do. And then I think, depending on what it is you want to do, I would say don't rule out any stage, you know, like there's still so much value in a stand up stage. There's still so much value in a, an improv stage. The internet is just another stage. So don't turn your nose up at TikTok and Instagram because that's a full way to get out there. Um, I'm a testament to it. Issa Rae started on a web series. Donald Glover started on a web series. Um, you know, the internet is a tool that should be used and like not looked down upon. So mm. it's my advice. What um, is the, your most favorite piece that you've created? Well, it's my show that hasn't come out yet. It's it's going to be mm. out in January. It's definitely my favorite thing I've done. I feel like my my whole career has been working toward this show, really. It's everything I ever wanted to do, everything I ever wanted to make. I think it's Can can you can you tell us about it? Yes. So, it's called Abbott Elementary and it's about a public school in Philadelphia and it's about teachers who work in that public school in Philadelphia. And it's a workplace comedy. Um, it's shot like the show The Office or like Parks and Rec. I don't know if you've seen those shows, <laughs> mockumentary style. But um, I'm excited about the stories we get to tell about teachers, but teachers in a Philadelphia public school. Like, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. and it's based on my mom and just me watching her be such a good teacher throughout the years. Actually, that's another distinction. The show is about good teachers, people who are good at their job. And... Um, and don't hate their jobs. I've seen shows about teachers where like, they just hate their jobs. And I'm always like, well, why are you there? Go do something mm -hmm. else. Like, mm -hmm. they don't get paid that much. They're there because they're they're good at it and they want to be there, a lot of them. So I'm excited to be able to show that and to bring a show to the screen that's about Black people, but not about being Black. Like, it's just mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. about our, our, our schools, our environments, and the positive. Mm -hmm. Word, word. And and when do we get to see this? In January. It'll be out in January. I don't have an exact date, but yeah, in January. So um, what's your favorite part about producing and writing? My favorite part about producing and writing is just creating new worlds. Um, I think it's super fun to write fiction and create characters based off of people in my real life and, and you know, make them interact and create fun scenarios and 
uh, have people identify with those characters. Um, it's just fun. It, I've always, I, I think I've always really loved writing and telling stories, you know, storytelling. And that's what I get to do. It's really just extended storytelling with writing a TV mm. show. So that's my favorite part. Let's double back for a second because you, you you wrote a show about good teachers, right? And and you talk about great teachers in your book. Um, tell us the the value of having a great teacher. And 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 now as an adult, do you how do you teach and how do you keep those relationships? How do you give in your relationships as a as now the one who's the professional and the the career woman? You mean give to like students or to to my teachers, my old teachers? No, your students, oh, students or what your concept of what a student is. You know, I now I feel like I'm in the position to like mentor, so to speak. So I try mm -hmm. to talk to younger creators, you know, if they reach out and ask for help and stuff, I will help and tell them about teach them about this about my place in this industry and how I've gotten to be where I am, even though I'm still just starting. Um, it's a lot of just like on-site mentoring. I mean, for instance, in my writer's room, we have a writer who came from the WB's writer's program, but she's a young black girl. And it's a lot of just like bringing her in the spaces and like, you know, she's learning on-site by being in the room kind of. So I think my best bet now has been just mentoring, making sure I'm available to give answers when people have questions. Because uh, in a lot of ways, I'm still learning my way myself, but kind of like giving back as much as I can. How do you defend yourself as a creative? Hmm. I mean, I, I pick my battles and I and I have to like stand on what I want to stand. Like for instance, with this show, there's there's like little things with this show where like at first the the studio when they were casting it, they casted uh, a bunch of different kids from LA, but those kids were not they were multicultural. And I said no, I said black kids. The kids have <laughs> <laughs> the kids have to be black, and they're like, well, did I said no? Let me tell you, West Philadelphia. Is it in it where I went to school was a predominantly black is a predominantly black area. If we do not do that, then we're not accurately reflecting the environment. And then the whole show doesn't work. Those little details are important. And you and I kind of talked about this because I think we pick our battles. But like when it came to like my book cover, I was like, I don't know what battle to fight here. You fought the battle for the cover of your book and I love it because it's outstanding, but you knew those little details were non-negotiable. And like, that's how I am about my, sh my show. And it's just standing firm. When you believe something, mm -hmm. you got to stand on two feet because they'll be quick to say, oh, but why can't it be some other way? And it's like, no, 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 this specific thing has to be that way. I'm not budging on that. We can find something else to budge on, but it won't be that. <laughs> but that's like, how did you know that? I guess that's the same question. Like, but how did you know you could like stand on your own two feet, like as a black woman? Because there are so many times I was just like, just be grateful for the opportunity. I'm how not, did you realize that you you were the opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I I'm very, you know, I I. I don't know. I go back to my schooling, like even going to the school Chad that I went to had a lot to do with like teaching you your value as an individual artist. Like we learned about people like Frida Kahlo and like in like these dope individual artists. And I was like, oh, like I've got the juice. It's me. Like it's just, I've got the juice. <laughs> and I, I do. I feel that way. I don't know. I don't know where all my confidence came from. I do think it's a mix of my family and my schools, but I'm a very confident person and I don't like, I don't know. It's worked for me so far. So I've never, I've never stopped being confident. <laughs> I, Cause I, I, I feel like the worst thing that can happen is like a no or whatever. Uh, but that's not the, that's not the worst. So I, I'm pretty confident about stuff. I, I know what I'm capable, what I can do, what I'm capable of. What's your favorite part of the book? 
my favorite part of the book is now this part that people keep pointing out to me and you, you we I, I veered away from it when I was talking about it earlier but you know there were times when my editor would be like you know working with me on a chapter and she's like she would like work on she would like can she would form an idea of a sentence and stuff and she would go you know I had no clue that that this was going to happen and like I had no idea what I was doing and I'm like that that I know what I'm doing all the time. I'm very intentional. <laughs> and even when I make a mistake, it's like, okay, I made the mistake, but I did it on purpose. But then I made, the mistake was made, but I did what I did on purpose. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like, I'm proud of being able to keep those moments in the book because I want black girls to see confidence. Like I'm not, I'm not like, you know, Issa's book is one of my favorite books, but it's it's the awkward black girl thing. That's not me. I'm very, very, very confident in what I'm doing. And I'm proud that I got to maintain that in the book, even in my mistakes and in my failures. Um, I, I want younger black girls to see that, like owning, owning every moment of their lives, so to speak. It's something like, I was like reading it, while I was getting my hair braided and it was something just calming, like like a friend was saying, girl, let me tell you what happened. And I'm like, <laughs> go, and I'm like listening to all of these stories, but it's it's written different. It's like, I, I haven't read a book that has, that is written like this. Really? Where it's, the language is, is friendly, it's inviting, it sounds conversational. And um, even when you say something as simple as mind you, I like underline that because I was like, I never saw that in text. I see it spoken. It's not in text. And so did you- Stuff I had to even... fight for in the book, like with my editor. Did you? She's like, what is mind you? And I'm like, just don't, <laughs> just shut up. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, let me, let me say it, please. Uh... <laughs> did, did you realize, did you, did you feel like your, your writing was different? Yeah, I did. I, I did, which scared me, you know, by the end of the book, I was like, uh Oh, is this gonna backfire on me? But you know, my favorite books are, I'm a conversational person, I can have conversation with anyone. And I do think that's one of the things that makes me unique as a, as a stand up as an as an artist in my work. And I, I'm proud of that. So I wanted that to be how I talk in the book, because I think that's what will set the book different, you know, apart from other books. What, mm -hmm. A lot of the books on the shelves sound the exact same. I want it to sound like myself. It's the whole reason why I'm writing a book. And then a lot of my favorite authors are are like that. Like one of my favorite authors uh, is um, Charles Bukowski, who a lot of people don't like, and I get it. Mm -hmm. But his books to me were always like, he was just talking. Like it was stream conscious. It was one of the first things I said to my editor. I was like, I wish this could be just stream of thought. She's like, it can't be. That's not a good book. And I was like, that's fair. But I like that approach. And I like being able to do that. And I think that's important for us to be able to do that. Everything doesn't have to be so controlled all the time. Like, you know, like, let us just like be free and talk. And so I really wanted to bring that to the book. So I'm over the moon to hear that you felt that way. That's like a big deal to me. I, and I giggled. It was like this little, it was small shit all the way through the book. Like I texted my friend and I was like, have you ever wondered where like Mary Kay and Ashley is? Like, it was just like little moments in the, or like uh, Robin Thicke pre-divorce. I was like, it was just those little things that were like anybody would render unnecessary. Right. But they made you laugh and they were oh, so, they, you. they added so much like, glitter to to your storytelling and i was Thanks, so girl. grateful that means that. a lot to me man i even like i had to fight for like the little chapter you know the the, I don't know, the chapters where i talk about my favorite things and like these some of them are so some of them are just memes but i'm like but that's how you communicate that's how you connect with people i want people to know what my favorite meme is when they read the book that tells them so much about me <laughs> More than did just, you have to fight for your photographs in the book did i have to fight for fo no uh, I had a lot of pictures actually ready to go in the book, but not all of them could fit uh, the book. A lot of them, it's weird, you know, we had that, like I said, that MySpace Facebook era. So I didn't, I didn't have as many physical pictures. They were like little uploads from like my mm -hmm. Verizon chocolate phone on Facebook. <laughs> mm -hmm. I tried to mm -hmm. take them off and, and give them to the publisher and they were like, girl, what is this? What is this little picture? <laughs> and I was like, 
<laughs> it was from my Verizon chaplet in 2007. Um, the so pictures definitely, it definitely added, it definitely, definitely gave us more wealth. I'm, I'm grateful for that. It, but it's all good. <laughs> why um this this might be a weird and this might be a weird question but like why is this book important well i think that it remains to be seen i i, I feel arrogant answering that question but i think to me it's important um because I, you know i i don't know how to answer that i think that that that's for the audience for people who read it to decide mm. I don't know if that one's what, what um is there something that you want people to remember from this book? I want people to remember that um mistakes are are okay, growing is okay, evolution is a huge part of the book. Like evolving is it's like the my main message I hammer home that evolving as a person is not, you know, a bad thing. And I wanted, you know, I think our era forces us to try to have a brand, you know, like our, our mm -hmm. uh, social media era is like, you need to have a brand and you need to stick to it. And I don't believe in that. I believe that people are built to evolve. That's why you get older and then, you know, you have a family and then you have kids and you get smarter, you get wiser. So if we keep getting stuck to these one moments, and I think that was a huge part of the book too, I never got stuck on my moments. I just allowed myself to evolve to the next one. I, and I, I want that for us. I want us to move on, to grow up, you know? Like, mm. I think a lot of millennials are, are just stuck right now in one place because they don't, they're refusing to evolve into the next phases of their life mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to grow up. Mm. It's okay to get old. Um, you know, youth is, is not forever. And I feel like a lot of people are hanging on to youth real hard. It's like, and I it's wait. wasted on the young youth it's is wasted, wasted on the young. young. I'm so excited hmm. about getting older. I think that's another important part of the book too. You know, I guess this, this was all leading me to say, I started thinking so much about young black kids while writing the book. That's where everything mm -hmm. started going to young black kids, young black girls. And I was like, just thinking that part of the you know and in philly it's a it's a it's a gun violence crisis in other places is a suicide crisis and yeah. there i just think there's a lack of appreciation for life that's happening and growing and getting older and they're not seeing past like 21 a lot of these kids and i want my book to help them see past 21 like i don't focus on materialistic things in my book. I talk about family. I talk about, you know, I talk about growth and getting older and, and or myself getting older, you know, and changing and growing and changing and learning. And I want them to hear those stories. I'm like, I don't think the youth obsession that we have right now is doing us any good because it's just not mm -hmm. helping people see, see past tomorrow. And so I, I hope that the book does that at the very least. I hope it gets into the hands of some young people. Someone wants to know um, about Laser Wolf and uh, what is your voice acting? How 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 is your voice acting different from being on camera? Voice acting is really fun because voice acting actually takes a a ton of talent, um, and and like not everybody can do it. So I feel really, I feel honored to be in the game. And like Laser Wolf was cool because Cree Summer, who was on Different World and uh, did the voice of Susie Carmichael and a bunch of voices, she voice coached me. And I think it's a crazy talent. To what be was that? Cree, Cree is incredible. She's so talented, a wonderful director. Her voice work is unparalleled. People don't even know how many voices she acted. She actually can do. She can do a lot. She can change her octave. She can put her voice all the way down here in her stomach. She can put it all the way up here if she wants. She can be a baby. Like, it's just like a cool talent to be able to change your voice like that. And and I really enjoy doing it, especially with voice acting. You get to be so many different characters. Like in the show Laser Wolf, I'm playing a wolf with a laser on my back. And that's dumb, but it's so fun and it's otherworldly. And then, um, you know, writing on that show was really fun because 
it's 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 a very silly obscure adult swim tv show and um i didn't get i hadn't gotten to write anything like that and with cartoons you can go anywhere and it's just different from writing for people on tv where you're usually bound to the structures of reality and that's fun too but with cartoons you're like i want this wolf to fly into the moon and that's okay <laughs> mm. Mm. yeah I literally went 30 minutes over. This was oh, only no. supposed This was only supposed to be 30 minutes and then we would talk for a whole hour. I am well, so fun. grateful. Um this was great. And um and and you asked me to do this talk and yeah. I feel very very honored um to okay. to be able to to host this and and to read your work um because I'm a fan of yours and you are incredibly inspirational and you are very very important to to the narrative of today's black girl and and is, right? and we look up to you and your work your work is important I um same and, I, and i hope and i i i hope to be and, and like you think about women all the time and like i was like i'm young enough to watch this woman's career and to talk about her and to write about her. And so I like, I get to say, she's important. I get to say uh -huh. like, this book is important. And, and, it, and it, it does warm your heart to know that like, you could go anywhere in the world, but it's like, truth be told, like you're a black girl from Philly and you do shit for black girls from Philly. Period. Um, and <laughs> period. So, on that him. note, <laughs> On that note, um, we are honored. We are we are more than honored to receive what you give to this world through your art, and we are thankful. So thank you thank on you. behalf of myself. Thank you. <laughs> on behalf sweet. of Uncle Bobby. Yes, thank you, thank you, Ned. And, and thank you, Uncle Bobby's, for having me. I can't wait until I get to come visit Uncle Bobby's for real in Philly. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't gotten to be there yet. I don't know if you've gone, Jasmine, but I haven't gotten to go yet. Not yet. Let me know when you go. I'll meet you there. Okay. <laughs> be there too. I'll be there too. So that brings us to the end of this wonderful conversation. Thank you to Jasmine and Quinta for taking the time out to be here with us tonight and make sure that you get your book. Get your book. You guys. can actually book. purchase book. it. You can you can purchase it right now uh, on the mm -hmm. link below. So mm -hmm. everybody go ahead and get your copy. Get both it's amazing. Them. Yeah. And if you're in Philly, like I said before in the beginning, um, you can come back down to Uncle Bobby's. I'm Shani. I'll be there. Shani will um, be there. Shiny will be there and y'all can come pick your books up or y'all can get them now or you can go straight to Uncle Bobby's bookshop and they will be available there to ship them to your house. Thank so, you, thank y'all so much. I wish y'all the nothing but the absolute best. Not like y'all not the best already because I'm fangirling so much. Thank you, girl. But I will talk to y'all soon. Bye. Bye. Uh -oh. oh, my fat thumb. <laughs>